All right. I think we're here. Okay. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon, evening. Thank you all for attending and um, hope everybody is staying well and, and safe in this time. And what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, talk about ground covers and a few other things. So let's get started. Uh, please don't hesitate to put your hand up if you do have uh, or click the question and answer button if you have questions and uh, Michelle will let me know when what you have to say or question and we'll see what we can do for you. This um, one other thing, this um, presentation will be available via a PDF if you would like a PDF sent to your email or you can have a recording sent, either one or both. Uh, so let us know uh, after, as we get done, you can let us know that that's something that you want and you can do that, I believe, in the chat section. So let's get started. <clears throat> so what we're going to do today, or what we're going to ground cover today, see my first joke, is we're going to find out what is a ground cover we're going to, or what is considered a ground cover. We're going to, you know, what are the benefits to a ground cover? Why you might want to be putting them in your yard or uh, if you're deciding to maybe change your yard, uh, consider them, uh, there will be some benefits. We'll uh, give you a little bit of heads up about uh, our rebate program that's available in Manatee County for certain homeowners. And the nine principles, Nine Principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping, which is, of course, very important to um, <clears throat> everybody if you're going to be doing gardening in Florida and hopefully uh, using less water and uh, having a more uh, uh, saving water, saving your money, having a healthy landscape. And also, we're going to tell you a little bit about different resources that will help you with plant selection once you do decide what you're going to be doing. I am the program assistant for the Mantee County um, Mobile Irrigation Lab. I am the program assistant in horticulture. And I am um, second part, uh, I work with Don. And we go out and do irrigation and landscape evaluations for Mantee County residents that have an in-ground irrigation system. And um, work with a working controller. And there are some rebates of programs that are available for certain um, Manatee County residents. If uh, your house has been built before uh, March of 2003 and you have a certain volume of water usage for a six month period of time, over 8,500 gallons a month, you have to have a backflow device and uh, you have to be on potable water. And uh, you have to have us come out and do an evaluation and then we, you have to do the repairs and then we come back out and do another uh, evaluation to confirm that. But there's different, uh, nine different uh, categories, as you can see. Um, most of the time, the, the categories that people use are either rain sensor, uh, shutoff device, uh, irrigation system repair or re retrofit, um, and or the landscape retrofit. The other ones are available, but again, it is certain uh, homeowners in Manatee County that qualify. Now, important things, if you're gonna be gardening and or making some changes, uh, you wanna make sure that you're following the nine Florida friendly landscaping principles. First one is right plant, right place. If you get that right, all the others, um, of course, do those as well, but, um, that first one is the most important, of course. Water efficiently, mulch, recycle, uh, fertilize appropriately, manage your yard, uh, yard pests. So, you know, go walk out, walk outside in your garden, enjoy your garden, enjoy your landscape. Uh, take a um, take the, look underneath your plant leaf. Look underneath there, see if there's any insects or anything. Look at your leaves and make sure you don't have some kind of um, problem with some kind of a fungus or some kind of disease starting and see why you, you know, 
the yard pest um, is going to occur sometimes because of uh, your giving them too uh, happy of an environment with t water on your um, plants. So that's another reason to um, try to use plants that are um, <clears throat> drought tolerant and use the correct kind of irrigation. Reduce stormwater runoff, attract wildlife, protect the waterfront. So let's, ta let's go into depth a little bit more on those principles. With the first one, which is right plant, right place. Uh, if you put in the right plant in the right place, and a lot of times if you'll use native plants, they're going to require the least amount of uh, water, fertilizer and pesticide. And you want to group uh, your plants according to what they need uh, in terms of water. So um, <clears throat> don't uh, put a, an annual that needs water every day with, say, a um, plant that only needs water once a week or so. Use ground covers where turf is difficult to maintain. That's like if you're underneath, a, say, an oak tree where there's lots of shade and turf is just not going to do well under there. Ground covers is a good alternative. And then if turf fails um, in locations, other locations, see what other options there are. Water efficiently. Overwatering can cause a problem with water pollution. Um, and when ex excess uh, fertilizer is used uh, and it's not used by the plants, it travels into your waterways or your underground. A result also can result with more plant disease. So it's very important not to overwater. You may, th sometimes you uh, may look at a plant and it's a little droopy and maybe you think it needs more water and, and actually it's just, uh, maybe it's heat stressed or maybe, maybe you've been watering it so much or it's raining so much uh, and the soil may be compact and it may be just being flooded and drowned. So got to make sure of why, you, you know, when you really need the water and how much. Water efficiently. Um, using micro irrigation in your landscape beds. Um, that's low uh, volume, low, much slower volume. And once your plants are established, you want to get the water right. Um, you want to, when you have micro irrigation, excuse me, you want to have irrigation, micro irrigation in your landscape beds only. Your spray heads or your turf uh, rotary heads are going to be for your turf grass. The micro irrigation is low volume. It's right there at the root zone. And that's all that your landscape plants need. And, this, and one thing is once they get established, their roots are going out into the turf grass. They don't need, uh, even sometimes they don't even need micro irrigation. But it's definitely something that's uh, one way of watering efficiently. And once you have the right plant um, established, you can pretty much turn that, turn the irrigation off for that, those plant beds. So again, best, good thing to do is use uh, Florida friendly plants or native plants. They're going to just need a lot less maintenance. <clears throat> okay, the third principle is to fertilize appropriately. And that means that you're, um, you want to think of the health of the, of your, retention pond. You want to make sure that you're using the correct amount of fertilizer and also the correct time of year, the correct amount. Um, and in winter time, you want to allow the grass to go dormant in the cooler months. There is, um, it's considered an area that's about 10 feet around um, water areas, ponds, lakes, things like that. Yours, it's a 10 foot maintenance free zone. Uh, so you don't really want to fertilize there. And the reason that would be is of course is to uh, keep that from run off into the ponds. Uh, there is a fertilizer ordinance that goes into place June 1st. To, um, so that's shortly in the next couple of days. When there's no fertilizer that has nitrogen or any phosphorus from June 1st through September 30th. And that's a fertilizer ordinance that's in place to uh, help lessen the amount of runoff 
of any kind of fertilizer like that in those months, especially with all the rains that we have. Ah, dang it. Okay, the fourth principle. Mulch. Um, it's got a lot of good uses, it beautifies the, the landscape, and it preserves moisture uh, in the root zone. Now, that is with a, an organic mulch. If you use rocks as a mulch around your landscape uh, plants, you're going to lose that um, attribute. You're also not going to get the, the amount of moderation of soil temperature that you would get with a wood or organic mulch. So um, University of Florida recommends that you use an organic or wood mulch that will uh, also put uh, organic matter as it decays and it will put organic matter back down into the uh, soil and it will help um, add organic matter down for the plants. The other thing that rocks or rubber mulch do is they heat up the soil. So it's better to use a wood or organic mulch. The fifth, uh, feature, uh, fifth Florida friendly landscape principle is to attract wildlife. We have a lot of wonderful things in Florida, a lot of wonderful wildlife. And some of it maybe you don't want to attract, but um, Provide a green corridor. Um, and if you can, as you plant things, if you can help uh, give, for instance, our pollinators, our butterflies, our birds, our bees, give them uh, plants that they're going to want to come see and have uh, drink nectar from and feed from, build their nest in amongst, give them a place to um, be happy. And That'll help your plants with their pollination and, and their pest control. Manage yard pests responsibly. And does anyone know what integrated pest management is? If you want to raise your hand, can we do that? We've got two hands raised. Okay. All right, integrated pest management. What that is, is meaning that you're going to go out there and you're going to look at your plants. You're going to look under the leaves. You're going to look at the health and how they look, see if you see any fungus. But an integrated pest being pest, you're going to see if you've got a, or if you do this, you know, at least every few days, you're going to get ahead of something that may get started. And you can use um, very, the least toxic method of, um, like a soap and soap and water solution to spray your plants if you have some um, aphids or some uh, white fly or mealybug things like that and you can get ahead of it and you don't have to sp spray heavy sprays and sometimes if it's a big enough bug and you see it soon enough you can just pick it off put it in a bucket of soapy water and you've done so integrated you're using very simple methods, but getting it done without the, a lot more toxic uh, chemicals. Uh, recycle. Uh, if you're either mowing your yard and you have a mulching mower that you can leave them um, clippings on your yard and that is going to just go back into your uh, lawn as fertilizer, but you can also uh, gather up your grass clippings and your leaves and can put it in your, if you have a mulch bin, um, you're recycling all that and it'll go back into your uh, landscape. Protect the waterfront. Maintenance-free zone of at least 10 feet, again, around the, um, that's what we were talking about before I was mentioning the, uh, well, there's no, uh, no fertilizer around that area. And you want to keep grass clippings really out of the storm drains because you don't want them that uh, draining down into our waterways and creating a problem with algae. I'm going to tell you, uh, just give you a, a 
couple of things here that will help you when you do decide or if you're trying to decide on what plants you want to either put in your um, yard or if you're getting ready to do a redo and add a redesign some things in your yard this is a wonderful resource and it's available um, if you've never if you don't have one I'm going to show you how to order one free and um, it's 110 pages and if you important page to start with is page 31 so that you can get, see the symbols and abbreviations so that you know uh, you know what when you get to the when you go into the book you'll see uh, the uh, symbols on the left side of the page and then you come across the page and you will see and here's a close-up so if you're seeing uh, for instance what what the scientific name is the common name uh, whether it's a, a native uh, what region it's in anyway the page 31 you go back to that that gives you all the symbols and once you've uh, done it a few times and look through the book you'll get a hang of what those symbols mean okay so Bowery, I just put the um, link to that plant guide in the chat so folks can link to it. It's available in a PDF online. Okay, and I have it in the next page. So thank you very much, uh, Michelle. And this is, tells you how to order your Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide. And you can either type in, there's either watermatters.org or the Swift Mud. Uh, website link they go to the same place and you it tells you where to click on resources then free publications and just step steps you through you can get a PDF and have a digital version and it's pretty cool how it flips through or you can get a real uh, 110 page paper book and they will send it to you free. Everything is free. It's a wonderful service. It's a wonderful resource. So you really definitely get one and tell your friends and neighbors about it too. Um, another resource is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Plant Database. If you go online um, to this, uh, to floridayards.org, and these, um, you go in into the database. There's other um, tools within that website, but this one, you click on what your region is and then what you're looking for. And this particular one, I clicked on ground covers and then you would click on different other information. So a couple of tools that will help you. And, and the most important tool of all, of course, is the University of Florida Extension where we are in Palmetto and the plant clinic there. Um, and we're available, not, not that we're there now, but we are available via email, we're available um, to help you answer your questions. Uh, but definitely anything that's re-based, re research-based science from University of Florida. If you do a search and you find publications um, on a particular subject that's about from University of Florida, you know it's going to be accurate information and good information to help you make your choices that you want to make for your plants. So, what is a ground cover? Um, it's essentially, it's a low ground, uh, low growing plant that uh, for all purposes, we're gonna say it's maybe no more than about three feet tall. Some of the plants that I have in here might get a little bit bigger than that, but um, we'll say it's three feet tall. It can function as a ground cover for one person, maybe a bedding plant for another. Um, sometimes I find that uh, you might want to use ground covers to in a place where you don't want to have as much turf grass because you want to um, once it's uh, ground covers are established usually there's less maintenance and less tur uh, fertilizer less water needed uh, so you can save uh, save some of your money for other things than watering your turf grass um, you have a lot of benefits from uh, ground covers that can provide energy savings. Uh, it can provide evaporative cooling. 
like I said, less fertilizer needed, less pest control measures needed. Uh, there's a range anywhere from full shade onto full sun. Some will grow the full range like that. Some are either or. And um, it helps with weed suppression and uh, definitely a lot of variety of what's available. So let's see what we get started with. Perennial, uh, ground covers, so a lot of people think that maybe ground covers, they want something other than grass and they still want to be able to walk on it. And there's a few that maybe like uh, dwarf mondo grass uh, might be something that you can walk on. Some of these others don't have as much walkability as or can handle as much traffic as maybe grass would, but you get the benefit of a lot less water needed and a lot less chemicals needed. And you, you can always put uh, st a stepping stone walkway or even a mulch walkway uh, through the uh, area that maybe you're turning into, you're uh, replacing your yard with a perennial peanut in this place, as you can see that what they've done here. Um, there are different kinds of uh, perennial peanut and some of them do better in this location. You want to, the EcoTurf uh, Repens uh, Golden Glory is better, the EcoTurf is a better version than a Pinto peanut. Perennial peanut, uh, in the winter time, it will go dormant if we have a really hard um, cold snap or frost, but it comes back in this in the sun uh, springtime. And um, if you look here, it's it grows really well in the full sun. But when we get to the shade, it doesn't creep into the shade as much as some other uh, ground covers might. So if you're looking for something underneath a uh, oak tree, this is maybe not what you want. And here's another version of somebody using this for their yard, front yard. This was in Bradenton, actually. It only gets to about a foot and a half, a, a half to one foot. It can be mowed like a grass yard. It doesn't have to be mowed very often, even if you do that. It doesn't really need um, fertilizer much at all. It's, uh, it's a great, nice little plant. There's disadvantages, like I said before, it doesn't do well in uh, shade and it does not traffic well, it does not take the cold well. But it, it's slow to establish, but um, you just take some time and space it out as you how, how you plant it and then it will get there eventually. So don't give up on it. So St. Barnard's Lily. Um, this is kind of reminds me a little bit of an African iris. It's a non-native. It uh, grows in zones 8 to 11. And it looks like it uh, pH is 6.0 to 7.2, medium drought tolerance, and likes full sun to partial shade. Here's something that um, most gardens have a lot of sun, although there are lots of plants that will do well in full shade, and mostly um, the cast iron plant prefers full, uh, more of shade. There's a variety in whether it's uh, spotted or uh, striped or solid color. One to three foot tall. Tolerates deep shade. Blue days. This is a color that you don't see as much in uh, the garden as, say, some other uh, colors in the spectrum. But this is a tough little plant. But it does well. Um, and I would say it's considered an, uh, a perennial here, maybe a little bit further north, another, maybe, uh, maybe zone eight or seven, it would be considered an annual, but here, uh, this is a nice little plant. 
And here you see it with, um, mixed with Xenia. Blue Pacific Juniper. Um, this is a great plant. It doesn't need lots of moisture, um, very drought tolerant. It does, I do believe it's considered a little bit uh, more uh, something that you should plant a little bit further away from the house if you're in a high uh, risk area for sun, um, fire. It grows slowly one to two feet and you can place it, it will spread out. When you're, place, uh, when you're putting, uh, planting it, you can spread it out somewhat uh, so that you don't have to, it will grow in, into each other. Full sun. Creeping juniper, um, this is definitely not something that you'd uh, be walking on, but it's a beautiful plant that uh, has some variety and coloring and again very drought tolerant doesn't need a lot of uh, maintenance or fertilizer green uh, liriope uh, there are different sizes, the smaller sized liriope and then the giant liriope. Uh, you'll see it in quite a few gardens and it's a nice accent plant. And you can hear it, see it here uh, in a, get a better sense of the size and in the landscape. Has nice little purple flowers, and you can see uh, the uh, the bed here on the right in bloom. Mondo grass, the dwarf mondo grass looks like just these little tufts, and that is much softer and um, will withstand a little bit more uh, foot traffic than most other. Uh, ground covers. However, you can see here they have just put in a nice little paver pathway so that you can enjoy walking through that and still not worry about it being like a walk, walking on your lawn. Okay, this is a wonderful little um, ground cover that's called Sunshine Mimosa or Powder Puff. And it, uh, a lot of people grow this and just as part of a uh, turf grass and they just let it grow in together and it kind of, uh, it, you can see it here growing in with the grass there. You can see it, it kind of is a, a bed next to some landscape plants. Here it's uh, being used in a median in a uh, parking lot and it's uh, there's a big I've seen a couple of uh, big patches of it over on Manatee Avenue back behind one of the auto uh, stores over there and it seems like it's pretty low maintenance. Sorry, I didn't get my mic on soon enough. Um, they have it at Costco too, the new Costco in uh, oh, Bradenton, quite a bit of it there growing nicely. Oh, great, great. It's a nice little plant. Um, Asiatic jasmine, you see this quite a bit. Um, there's variegated um, on one side, uh, well, it's next to uh, some arbicola. But here you see the green next to the walkway and the variegated. Um, when you first put this in, I believe they say it sleeps, then it creeps the second year and the third year it leaps. And so it takes a little while to get established, but it's a wonderful plant and um, it fills in nicely and it's a great 
uh, plant to not have a lot of maintenance needed, but uh, quite lovely. And as you can see here, this makes kind of, if you're going to have anything next to a walkway and to be that narrow, I guess this would probably be as, uh, probably as good a choice as anything because it, you can keep it maintained fairly easily and um, whereas it would not make sense to have grass there. One other, I guess the drawback to having uh, Asiatic jasmine is if it climbs up the wall and you don't like that or what, you know, uh, discoloration that can have and a little bit of extra maintenance that's going to uh, create for you. But I think it's, it's a beautiful plant worth having. It's very versatile and very, uh, has a lot of range for the pH that it will tolerate for the soil. Confederate jasmine, um, you see that a lot of times uh, climbing on uh, trellises. And a lot of times people will actually just uh, plant it and let it um, kind of trail along the, the ground. Um, and you can see that when uh, in the springtime it will flush out with light green leaves and white flowers. Again, it's very, um, very uh, tolerant of P soil pH and um, full sun to partial shade. Tracks hummingbirds uh, and one to three feet, or as you can see, one to 30 feet wide, so. Periwinkles. Um, a colorful, uh, you've got, uh, they like to be, they like some wa a good amount of uh, water, but they don't like to be irrigated so much that uh, it, they get drowned. They, they want to dry out between waterings a little bit. Kuntis. Um, is a really good alternative plant to, uh, we have a lot of sago palms in our landscapes and unfortunately sago palms get, can get, a pro have a problem with scale. And of course their size and uh, uh, scale to in a landscape aren't really considered uh, for a ground cover. But the Kuntis stay you know, no more than about three to four feet tall. And they're very cold tolerant and they are a um, host plant for the Attila butterfly. Beach sunflower. If you live out on the beach somewhere, you're going to be, this is some plant that you probably will see. And if you don't have it, you may want to incorporate it into your landscape. It's very, um, it's, it likes zone 10A, although we did grow some at the extension office here uh, in Palmetto and um, it likes it dry though. It doesn't want to get wet feet. It wants to be well-drained soil. It's a very vigorous plant. You put down a few plants and it will fill in quickly and get up to three feet easily and doesn't need a lot of maintenance, but definitely well-drained. And again, 9B, it might get too cold for it. 9A, it definitely probably would if we had a frost. Aloe vera. Growing in the landscape, it's um, handy to have if you've been sunburned or just as a, something definitely to enjoy in your landscape. You can see that it has nice flowers in the winter and springtime. This was actually uh, taken over at the Bradenton uh, Manatee River Garden Club over in Bradenton. It's 
anybody growing blue-eyed grass in their yard? Anybody, do you see any hands here? No? Okay, blue-eyed grass is not as drought tolerant as some of these other plants. It actually likes a, kind of a, a little bit of more of a loamy soil, um, a little moisture, but it's a really nice little plant. It's a native. Midsummer aster or Stokes aster, aster um, loves, uh, butterflies love this plant. Scorpion's tail, that's a really interesting little plant. It has kind of a curled over tail or flower bloom. Um, and we have a nice uh, bit of it in the educational garden at the extension office, the Master Gardener's Educational Garden. It would be a nice uh, size hedge or dividing planting uh, between uh, other plants or accent in a yard, in a garden. Now we're going to get into some other ground cover options that um, the gallardia is the or the blanket flower is the um, flower here are the orange ones these uh, and this is the liatris or the blazing star these photos were taken at the Naples Botanical Garden by Michelle and uh, it's a beautiful park, it looks like, from the pictures. Now, we talk about being three feet tall. And I know these are definitely, uh, Bougainvillea definitely is not three feet tall. There is a compact version that will stay much shorter. Uh, you don't have as much choice in your colors, but uh, I, this was such a wonderful footer just a, a re remember to make sure that it's the compact version if you're going to uh, in, decide to put some bougainvillea in as a ground cover in terms of height. And another thing to remember when you're putting in bougainvillea is where it is, cl how close it is to your walkway. Um, if you're putting in a regular bougainvillea, you're going to have some maintenance and pruning to continue as an ongoing uh, maintenance. Are there people, is everybody uh, planning on, anybody planning on doing changes in their yard for, with and incorporating more ground covers and removing, um, <laughs> removing turf? Okay, great. Looks like. Uh, you see the hands? Yes, I do. Lots of hands. Good. That's good. That's good. And is it, uh, I guess the next question would be probably because, uh, you want less maintenance um, because you're trying to change your yard for, okay. I, ca I can see the raised hands. I don't see what, what they're saying. Okay. Um, this plant here called Purple Heart or Purple Queen, uh, you can see it has a nice little pink uh, flower and it's a very vigorous grower. You really don't have to do much, almost putting, just take a, uh, a piece off and stick it in the ground, it'll grow, it's that vigorous. But uh, it's a great plant. You can even put it in a nice big pot and it'll trail over. It's a nice, uh, it'll grow in shade, it'll grow in sun, it's a great plant. Bromeliads, the, the variety of, uh, bromeliads that will, it ranges from full shade to full sun and somewhere in between. There's such a variety in color. Uh, we have a beautiful bromeliad garden that was put together by one of our master gardeners at uh, Maureen at the extension office. So when we're back open, 
If you haven't seen it, definitely come and visit and uh, enjoy our educational garden as well. Crown of Thorns. Um, I think this is a pretty unique plant. It's very drought tolerant. Uh, there's smaller flowered ones, there's larger flowers, there's some that um, a lot of times you see them, they're more of a upright stalk. Sometimes I've seen small ones, small versions that are more like a uh, just a small hedge. But um, I love the the spines on the stem and uh, probably could be used as a security fence if you had it growing tall enough, if you needed that. Fakahatchee, dwarf Fakahatchee, and I say dwarf because it stays to about three feet in height. There is a regular Fakahatchee that is, um, gets more about five feet or more, and it's a great plant. It's very, um, it's a very low maintenance, beautiful plant. Whirling butterflies, um, it's a great plant. They, they really do wave in a little bit of wind and they look like it's butterflies flying around. Shrimp plant, there is a yellow version. The, uh, the orange uh, version I believe is the native. Frog fruit, also called matchweed. And this is only about, mm, gets maybe six to eight inches tall. And I have it growing in my yard. I don't have any kind of irrigation. I have bahia grass in my yard and it's just there. It's volunteer and it's a great little plant. Uh, you can see actually pretty good patches of it if you uh, wanted to supplement and help it along and, you know, add a few more plants. Uh, you could have quite a nice uh, patch of it. Blackberry lily. This is, um, as you can see, it uh, gets about three to four feet tall max and it's a wonderful plant. Uh, quite beautiful. I've seen it in gardens where there was no irrigation at all. And this one here has a little bit of irrigation in this front entry area, but I've definitely uh, seen it in landscapes where there's absolutely no irrigation, not even micro irrigation. So it's definitely a very uh, sturdy plant. Now, does anybody know, um, has anybody eaten the dwarf natal plum, this red fruit here in this picture? It is an edible plant. Um, it's also, uh, again, a good security fence. As you can see, it has some spines on it. There is a dwarf version, again, about three feet in height. Aha, Don's eaten the dwarf natal plum. Great. Um, there is a, um, a version of this plant that gets around five to six feet tall. But again, I say dwarf version just because if you're we're talking about ground covers, thinking something that's going to stay uh, around three feet tall or up to. We got two different version, uh, two different plants in here. We have African iris in the background, and we have red, the red pences in the front. Those are good um, options for ground covers. The African iris. Uh, tends to want to, they don't mind having a little bit, uh, an area that has wetter feet uh, down maybe by a, a little bit closer to a pond. There are different versions, uh, cultivars of the uh, pentas that are uh, the dwarf variety or smaller variety that are, only get around one and a half to feet, two feet tall. And then of course the pentas the bigger version that get maybe two to three feet tall. And there's a little bit of variety in the color in the pentas. Coreopsis um, or tick seed. And you can see that is 
beautiful flowering plant. You can see a little bit of difference here in the, the bloom, different cultivar. Again, another photograph from the Na uh, Naples Botanical Park. Um, this is bulbine, nice succulent or semi-succulent, I guess you'd say. Uh, needs a little bit of moisture, but not a lot. And it'll grow in kind of partial shade. Probably half and half would be happier. This you don't see too often. You can see it sometimes when you go out into the, which, but I think this was taken in Bradenton, uh, not even out by the beach. And it, um, I've, I've got photographs in people's yards that where it's out in um, sandy areas and doing fine. And so it seems to do uh, well in um, dunes and areas where there's uh, salt issues. It's a beautiful little plant, succulent. Obviously, maybe not something you're going to walk on, but it's a, it's a very low maintenance plant. We see um, if you pick this plant up and you break the stem and you smell it, you will smell like it smells like garlic. That's why it's called that. But it's also, um, um, it's a nice little plant for your, uh, to be a part of your landscape. Some people won't have it in their landscape because they don't like garlic. But I think it, it's just a pretty little flower and it should definitely be something to be considered. Firecracker plant. Um, I have the picture of the white bloom up here. You don't really see that in the landscape very often, but it does exist. Um, this one, it has a wonderful habit or the growth habit. It has more of a cascading effect so that this was actually planted in a, a planter bed that was about, oh, at least two feet off the ground. And so it was cas it cascades over the side. So it's uh, it's something uh, to think about how you plant your plants as to how their their growth habit is and um, you know how they spread and how what their mature height is. So that's something that when you go back and you go into the Florida Friendly Landscape Guide, you'll see it'll give you what the mature height and the mature spread will be. So that's definitely something to think about when you're planting or designing your yard or putting uh, plants in your yard is to think about, uh, do you need four plants for this area? Do you only need two or three? Because you've got to space them out enough so that when they finally grow in, they're not just going to be jam packed and then you'd have to be taking stuff out. So uh, it's a real important um, thing to think about is what is a mature size uh, when you are planning and designing what you're putting in your yard. Porter weed. This was, um, this is considered the native version of porter weed. As you can see, it's kind of low growing, it sprawls out and um, this is a picture of the flower. If you look at this next one, this is more upright version and this is non-native, but um, it gets about five, maybe even six feet in height. Again, the non-native is more, I mean the native is more sprawling. So again, depending on uh, what you want in your yard and what kind of treatment you want or where you want to put it. This uh, porter weed is pretty, the uh, native is pretty, um, it's a vigorous plant, let's put it that way. It can get a little sensitive if it freezes, but it'll, and uh, you'll get a dis little discoloration on the leaf when it uh, gets that cold, but it's, it's real sturdy and it'll definitely come back if it freezes back. The uh, the porter weed, this non-native porter weed also, also comes in a red flower. The coral honeysuckle, um, or also called trumpet honeysuckle, um, this is actually a photograph, photographs taken at our educational garden at the extension office. And it's a great 
plant for hummingbirds. And you can see we've got a nice seating or uh, benches back in there. So uh, when we all get to go back to work and get to come and visit us at the uh, extension office. Dwarf chenille, um, this is a wonder, there is a regular size chenille plant that's more about three feet tall and that would be okay too if you want to say keep something under around three feet tall. But this is really cool plant that is, it really only gets to be about well, maybe a foot tall and uh, the, the little blooms are real soft and fuzzy and you can see this is a really nice planting of it um, and just that I saw on one of our uh, evaluations. It was a really beautiful landscape. Sedums, uh, there's a lot of variety in types of sedums or succulents that a little, little difference in shape and uh, whether they, most of the time I think they're gonna generally do best in maybe semi or part sun, part shade. Some of them want only shade, but uh, they're amazing variety in sh uh, color and shape. Purple coneflower, um, echinacea, wonderful uh, pollinator or bee uh, attractor. We have a question. Michelle? Yeah, we do. I'm trying to answer them. Um, folks are asking about the pH of the soil and water needs of some plants. So, oh, okay. Well, um, I can slow down. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I'm just, I'm uh, pulling fact sheets and typing it in. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, purple coneflower, uh, again, uh, it's a great plant for um, pollinators. So definitely we want to uh, consider another thing when we're planning our garden or things that we want to add to our garden is uh, what kind of pollinators does it, what kind of pollinators and bees, butterflies, birds, what, what type of uh, plants are attractive to them. It's just going to enhance your garden and enhance your life. Uh, coleus, you know, you, you think that I always thought coleus did well in mostly in shade, but obviously you can see that um, this is a pretty happy uh, uh, growth uh, uh, hedge of these uh, particular coleus. Salvia, um, again, variety of color and um, most of them, I think, do well in shade. Uh, some of them can do with uh, at least part sun, part shade. And some will do fine with the full range. Walking iris. Um, it's a beautiful plant and the, the um, plant goes down, puts a runner down and uh, that's how it kind of spreads. Crossandra or firecracker flower um, comes in a variety of, of well, either yellow or orange and it's a very uh, pretty low maintenance plant. I don't think it needs lots of water and uh, a nice different, a little bit different shape, texture for your design um, offerings in your plant, in your landscape. This plant is uh, called golden creeper or beach creeper and it's something that generally, well, I see it out at the beach areas uh, quite often, but I've seen it growing in um, Bradenton as well. And um, actually they were forming it more as a hedge, um, small, you know, a short hedge, but this was growing here at the extension office uh, for a while when we had, uh, planted it um, out front and it was doing fine. It was a wonderful plant. So depending on what kind of, if you want a more formal uh, shape, you could always, uh, you could put it in a hedge, but 
this is the, you can see more free form in the one photo on the left. <clears throat> Muley grass uh, has the beautiful plumes and that usually you'll see that in October uh, of the year and it we're going to have bloom for about or the color for about a month and then usually it's cut back and you still have a nice uh, plant ornamental grass plant and uh, for the rest of the year but it's a beautiful plant sometimes the the weather can make the plant kind of confused and it might bloom more, you know, maybe more or another time during the year. But uh, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful feathery soft uh, plume plant. Creeping sage, you don't see this very often, but it's, uh, it can grow in quite a bit of shade. Uh, it has a really nice little mint um, fragrance to it. It has a little tiny blue flower that I don't show you here, but it, I promise you it does <laughs> have that. And uh, again, it doesn't need lots of, um, it doesn't need lots of moisture or maintenance once it's been established. These, uh, this Silver Falls plant was taken, um, this was taken at the Naples Botanical Park. I've also seen this plant used as a hanging plant, the, uh, this silver part right here. Uh, let me see. Um, but it's meant for, it's meant more for a zone 10. We're in 9B, so if you're out by the beach or Northwest Braden, you can probably have this plant if you wanted it because you stay much warmer out there, even when we're having cold weather. Black-Eyed Susan, um, this is a great plant. You can see it gives a lot of sunshine in our lives. Lily of the, uh, the Nile or Agapanthus, we see that a lot in our landscapes. It's a nice, uh, nice, nice height and, and the beautiful color of the lavender color. It doesn't take a lot of um, maintenance once it's established. Railroad vine is um, this is something that normally you're going to see again out by the beach. It's very salt, salt tolerant. It's um, the where this photograph was taken was out in Northwest Braden and real close to the Palmasola Bay. And uh, she had, uh, she said, the homeowner said that what she did was when a runner went outside or close to the road, she'd just pick up the runner and pop it back over into the yard and let it take root there. And so she was making her yard out of this um, railroad vine and it was doing a great job. And she really didn't have to do much other than just occasionally pop the vine, the runner back into the yard. So we are to the end of our uh, presentation. Are there any questions? Michelle? I'm sorry. Hi, Valerie. Hi. <laughs> um, questions. My two bougainvillea has been without blooms for a while. They're in full sun. Any suggestions? My question is how uh, bougainvillea likes to be a little bit of water, but not overwatered. Usually Overwatering will make leaves drop off, possibly, and not bloom as much. Um, there are 
fertilizers that are made especially for uh, bougainvillea that might help depending I don't know what you've been doing other than that but usually the problem with not blooming is too much water a lot of times and you say it's in full sun they like it eight to ten hours of sun um, bougainvillea is walking iris native I believe so I can, I'll look that up and answer. Okay, I'm not positive, but yeah, I think we'll it answer is. it in the actual Q&A. Okay. I'll type it in. Um, okay. For Miami, where can, let's see, where can we have a lot of sun or flooding? What would you recommend? I'm sorry, say that again, please. For Miami, where we can have a lot of sun or flooding, what would you recommend? Um, Dog fruit. Um, yeah. Things that can handle a lot of, yeah, frog fruit would be fine. Um, a lot of flooding, lots of sun. Uh, you definitely want things that are can handle uh, getting their feet wet. And again, it depends on, so flooding, uh, what kind of soil do you have? Do you have compact soils? Do you have very sandy soils? Does it drain well? Those are things, that, depending on in your yard, where but frog fruit would be one. Uh, African iris can handle moisture. Uh, canna lilies, uh, which get a little bit taller, but they can handle a lot. Of, they can handle more moisture on their feet, and kind of prefer it, and have beautiful flowers. Okay. Uh, another question. What about ferns? Um, autumn fern. Uh, the, uh, let's see what else, in terms of, you know, in terms of, let's see, <sighs> trying to think, can't, I'm blanking, uh, leather fern, leather leaf fern, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, there are two ferns that look very much the same, the sword fern and the Boston fern, and you have to right. be very careful because yes. one of them is invasive. And the right. way you can tell it's invasive is it grows in the sun and goes crazy, um, where the native tends to like it more in shaded areas and it will stay in the flower bed. Um, so we do have some ferns that are, are good. There's also uh, the macho fern, which gets pretty tall, um, considered a native as well. Uh, Ferns can be good ground covers. You just got to get them in the right place. Right. Right. So another question. Can you find all of these at local nurseries? No, not necessarily. I would say um, it's okay to check with your box stores, but definitely check out your uh, independent nurseries. Um, yeah, there's a variety. We have pretty good variety of nurseries. We have native, a couple of native plant nurseries in Manatee County. We have um, other nurseries in Manatee County that, and Sarasota and St. Pete and, and a variety of places. So that check out the independent nurseries that are probably going to have more variety and um, possibly more knowledgeable people that can help you with your uh, plants. Okay, someone's asking when we will be open again. Um, that is a wonderful question. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we don't know the answer. Uh, we are currently held up with the availability of uh, sanitation supplies and PPE for employees. Employees aren't even allowed back in our buildings currently. Um, and then we will go back uh, slowly, 25%, then 50%. So it's looking like it might be into July before we are open back up in the office. But the good news is if you're coming to the Manatee office, there is a card out front and there is a doorbell. Um, so if you're needing to drop things off, um, you know, like a soil sample or they are doing some plant questions, uh, if you can leave a sample of something, um, the master gardeners are still accepting some of that so um you know just you can email myself or valerie and we can try to work with you to get that arranged if you need help definitely okay um best way to prop up your bromeliads 
Um, hmm. You got any ideas, Michelle? <laughs> um, well, let's see. Bromeliads don't really, the, the roots are just there more as an anchor. They don't really take up nutrients so much. Um, the nutrients really come more from what they collect in their top. So uh, when you're saying prop up, maybe I need a better explanation of what that is. Uh, they kind of just, we call them pup. Um, and they kind of spread out, but you can use liquid nail and stick them on trees or on <laughs> trellises or things like that. Um, there are ways that you can do it. Sometimes people tie them to, um, well, to a tree or gently, but yeah, if you're leaving them on the ground, then I guess you need just some kind of a support that but if you want to actually secure them to something. Right. Um, okay, so the Miami question, she's saying she has very compact soil in Miami. So okay. that's, you know, you got it like frog fruit or matchweed. Um, those yeah. are going to be fine for that compact soil condition. Uh, somebody's asking about warp fern, and I'm looking up warp fern because I'm not that familiar with it. And it says for central and south, it is a caution plant. So we would not recommend planting warp fern. Um, caution meaning it could become invasive. And so the University of Florida is not going to recommend that you plant that at this point. Um, and then we have, um, we talked about soap and water to treat pests. When is the right time to integrate other kinds of pesticide or other kind of pesticide? Say that again, please. You talked about soap and water to treat yes. pests. Yes. When uh, is the right time to integrate? You can use soapy water solution once a week and it will not be too much. Um, you want to use about two to two and a half tablespoons of uh, something like a Dawn dish soap or ivory liquid soap. Be sure it's a soap and not a detergent and to a gallon of water. And you mix that up and put it in a spray bottle and you can spray your plants underneath the leaf and on the top pretty much year round. If you're using, if it's during, let's say November through about March, April maybe, any temperature below 80 degrees, you can actually add some oil, um, like a, even a vegetable oil to the solution. And if you would like a rest, the recipe for that, we can, if you'll give us an email, we can send that to you. Uh, there's a, we have a nice uh, fact sheet that will give you that information. But so, the so oil helps. Great. Yeah, that's great for the soap and oil, but I think she's asking uh, when should they step it up to something else? Um, oh, I'm sorry. A, okay. Yeah, a higher level. And um, so, you know, basically when, if that's not working, um, then I would. Soaps and oils can treat things like um, aphids and scale, uh, but there are other pests like white fly that um, aren't going to be really treated by soaps and oil. And you, you're going to need, uh, if you have a white fly infestation, um, you might need a heavier duty pesticide for something like that. Um, but for your, you know, aphids and um, some scale, not all scale, some scale, it's, they're a little challenging to get rid of too. Um, but this is where we are happy to help you uh, with our extension service um, to kind of tell you the best way to treat different insects. Funny story, I had someone call one time and send me emails. Uh, you can hear my dog's eating his dinner. The bowl is hiding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, somebody sent me pictures one time and said they had scale on their uh, ligustrum tree. 
and that they had tried everything and just could not get rid of that scale. And so I asked them to send me some up close pictures and they did. And it was actually little nodes that are present on the custom trees. It's just a part of the tree. It was mm. not scale. Um, so we always identify the problem that we have before we ever go forward with treatment. Um, but, you know, we're happy to help you. And basically, if you are not getting a result with the soap and water, um, let us know and we'll, we'll give you a suggestion of how you can treat it. Uh, okay, so Dawn makes me cringe. It has a degreaser, which can be harmful. Yep, degreasers are not good for plants. Natural oils on plants, it'll strip them right off. Uh, somebody's got a comment in here. Love all the ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everybody. Thank you, everybody, for attending and all your questions and um, 